Judges chapter number 6. Stand when you find it. Judges chapter number 6. Brother Durant, it's good to see you. I don't get to see you very much. You're usually in and out. How are you feeling? Good? Good. It's good to see you. Appreciate your faithfulness. A lot of years now. You're getting older and wiser. <laughs> I guess so you ask anybody a question in church, they're like, I can't lie. <laughs> well, I sure am glad you're here. I really appreciate it. Good to see all of you here today. What a great crowd, man. You would never know that there was anything going on in the rest of the world. So wouldn't it be good if today were the day? Yes, sir. Amen. I mean, man, wouldn't it be a blessing if all of a sudden the Lord blew the horn and yes, we started flying Amen. and say goodbye to this place? And I did that funeral yesterday, or took a portion of the funeral yesterday, was there for Brother Bobby's uh, funeral, and somebody was talking about, well, I don't, I don't want to just go, you know, because I want to get off the earth. I said, I do. Amen. Well, you know, I want to go because I really love Jesus. I said, yeah, me too, but I want to get off the earth. Amen. Uh, I've had enough. Uh, I realize one more day, well, it's another day to serve Jesus. It's also another day to go to the devil, too. <laughs> I, I just know me well enough to know that all it takes is there's, you know, but what a step, one step between me and yeah. death, just like that. Yeah. And sometimes that death is a spiritual death. Yeah. And sometimes we don't recognize, we, we sometimes think we're stronger than we really are. Yeah. And then something comes along and just like that, we lose the perspective of eternity and lose the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I'm not going to read you the whole passage here, but... I want you to recognize here in Judges chapter, uh, Judges chapter number 7, if you would please pick it up in verse number 16, and then I'm going to go all the way back to chapter number 6. I'm going to show you the beginnings of a great man. Judges chapter 7, verse 16, he divided 300 men into three companies and put a trumpet in every man's hand and empty pitchers and lamps with the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me, and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow with the trumpet, I and all there with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp, and the beginning of the middle of the watch that they had newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps left in their, hand, in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands and blow with all. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled, and three hundred blew the trumpets. And the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, and even throughout the host of all, and the host fell from Bethshedah unto Zerath, unto the border of Abel Meholel, unto Tabith. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali, and out of Asher, and out of Manasseh, and pursued the Midianites. Verse 24, And Gideon sent messengers throughout all the Mount Ephraim and said, Come down against the Midianites and take therefore before them to the waters of Beth Barah and of Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Barah and Jordan. And they took the two princes of the Midianites and Oreb and Zeb. And they slew Oreb upon the rock of Oreb and Zeb. They slew upon the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. Would you call that a great victory? Would you call it a supernatural victory? Without them having to draw their own swords, God wrought a great victory just because of obedience. Brother Larry, you pray and ask the Lord to help us, would you please? Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Judges 6. There's a principle in the Bible... I might even call it the loneliness of command. I might call it dancing alone or being willing to go alone. 
But there's a principle in the Bible, most everybody knows the Bible stories. Moses parting the Red Sea, Noah and the ark, and David and Goliath. Most all the kids even know the story about Gideon and the pitchers with the lamps on the inside and the trumpet being blown. And most of them know those stories without considering what's behind the story. A lot of preachers don't preach them because they sound somewhat like nursery rhymes. And for me, it, it makes it a little simple, a little bit easier because it's in a storybook form. So I'm able in my mind to kind of see a practical application from a great man in the Bible and maybe some things that I could learn from. I, I like the fact that Joshua was a, a Schultz soldier, so it's easy to follow things about Joshua and what he did for Moses and those kind of things. I like David because that's my namesake. I think that when my dad named me, I think he had a purpose or a reason behind it. I think he chose the biblical name, but I think not that he wanted me to be a king, but that maybe I might see some things in the man called David in the Bible that I might grow into those things. I, I think, you know, you might call it a diabolical scheme, but I actually think he thought about that. I'm glad he named me David. I've killed no giants in my life and certainly have not aspired to be a king, but nonetheless, I can tell you on a number of occasions I have been said, do you live up to your namesake? And God gives you a name for a reason. Even after you're saved, you're going to see Gideon's name here in just a minute is going to be changed and it's going to be changed because he is an enemy of the right people. But I think we often miss the the effort that goes behind some of the great men in the Bible. I mentioned to you in Sunday school about a man by the name of Joshua who says, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. He didn't ask his wife what she thought about it. He just said, we're going to serve the Lord. But they'd been serving the Lord. But a lot of people don't know Joshua's track history. 20 years he had been in captivity and had been making bricks. Doesn't sound like much as far as being one of the greatest warriors in all the Bible as far as training, but there's discipline being learned in making bricks for somebody else. It's a form of character, learning to do things you don't like to do. And sometimes we don't realize that those things are in our life early on to keep us from quitting things later on because enduring that hardness becomes difficult. Nowadays, Christians, they're blow away at the first sign of a little trouble or trial or tribulation. They serve a God who is nothing but love and, and nothing but a give me kind of God. But let God allow some trouble in their life. And boy, I mean, they are just like Gideon's guys. Starts off with 32,000. And then here's what he says. Hey boys, we're going into war. Now they don't know it's going to be with a pitcher and all this other stuff. All they know is, is that we're going into war. And you know what his first command to them was? He says, listen, anybody that's faint-hearted, anybody that is afraid to go into battle, go ahead and leave now. He starts with 32,000. Two-thirds of his army walks off. Two-thirds of Gideon's army says, that ain't for us. Two-thirds of his army said, way too much for me. No, I'm going home to mama. I'm going home to my houses and my lands. I'm going home. No, uh, it ain't worth fighting. Two thirds, 23,000, 22,000 walked off that day right then and left and said, we'll see you later because too much pressure, too much difficulty, being unwilling to stand alone. I didn't sign on for trouble and trials and difficulties and I didn't, I didn't sign on for this. I, I got saved to get out of hell and to have a happy, prosperous life and do whatever I wanted to do, but you want me to fight? No, no. Do you want me to endure hard? No, you want me to stand and, and take a beating for the... No, no, uh -uh, no, no. No, see, it's about me. I'm going to preserve me. Many people take a man named Noah for granted. Noah, a preacher of righteousness for... A very long period of time, over a hundred years, you know what he said? It's going to rain. You know what they did? They laughed at him. Sure. They had ark days where they would come out there while he was building that boat that's 
300 yards long and 50 yards wide and, and all that kind of stuff. And they're watching. Do you ever stop to think how long it took all those animals to get from wherever they had to get from to get there on the day that he sat up like Tarzan and made his holler and all of a sudden, two by two, the animals that were against each other, the animals that fought with each other, Amen. sounds like a Baptist church, the animals that were always backbiting each other and eating each other, they're lining up. And two by two by two by two, they're walking in the... Those people got to witness one of the greatest miracles that anybody has ever seen. Somebody standing there going, man, I heard about him, but I thought that one thing was up in Sweden somewhere. I mean, my papa told me about him, but I thought he was down in Africa somewhere. And what about that? I reckon how they, they've been walking for all that time to load up that ark. Amen. And they witnessed that. And they laughed and they mocked and they belittled. And can you imagine the ridicule that he was under? People say it's difficult nowadays. Hey, only eight people were saved in that day. Everybody else in the world was against Noah. Yes, sir. Modern day Christian would say, no, not me, man. I'm not going to stand on the bow of a boat having never seen rain a day in my life. Listen to modern science. Call me a fool. Call me an idiot because I believe God. And they say the water's coming up from the ground and we've never seen that. And you don't need a boat for anything like that. And listen, day in and day out, as they laugh, as they mock, as they make fun. Yeah. Maybe and yet he continued to build. Amen. That's an amazing thing. Yes. That's real manhood to me. Amen. Some of you are already fixated. Well, you know what happened to him after the flood? Well, I don't know what it is about mankind that is always so interested in everybody's failure. Right. Yeah. Instead of going, yeah, but he had a pretty great success. Yes. Amen. You ever pause to think, where would you be if it hadn't been for Noah making it on the ark? Yeah. So instead of hurrying up there to point out his mistake, not too bad of a record for a man that God chose to build an ark and to stand strong. And the day came. And they thought that it was still dark outside, but they didn't realize the clouds had blotted out the sun. And the sky turned pitch black. And the thunder began to roll like cannon on a battlefield. Lightning looking like rockets flying from one end of the sky to the other. The horizon now dark and the wind begins to turn cool and it begins to pick up as it sucks the moisture off of that ground up into those clouds and they build and higher and higher and higher they go. And there's a little nervousness and here comes a mama with a baby and Okay, Noah. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, come on, man. I mean, how about my baby, Noah? No, the Lord shut to the door. Yes, come on, Noah. My, my, my father's he's crippled. He, he's in. Come on, you can take him. Sorry, the Lord shut to the door. Your chance to get on has passed. Noah, surely God is a loving God, a caring God, a compassionate God. He had the ark built and told you to get on, but it's too late. He's closed the door. You can't get on. And at a rate of about four feet per minute, the rain came for 40 days and 40 nights until it literally aswads an overflowed Mount Everest. Hundreds of thousands of people drowned. Babies' lungs exploded from drinking in all of the waters and mamas cried and yelled and screamed and daddies cursed and marked and mocked. And yet Noah stayed faithful to what God said. And it's hard to find men and women like that nowadays. There's a flood coming. Yes. Joshua? Yes, sir. Take Jericho. Lord, we're not battle hardened. Walk around the city. Yeah. Don't say nothing. Just trust me. Line up like animals going in the ark. And around that walled city they go. Do you think that the people inside of Jericho 
one of the most successful, well-fortified cities, the opening doorway into Canaan. Do you think that the people cowered in their houses? Or do you think they got up there and they were peering down off of that wall and looking down there and laughing at people who were walking without a sword, without a spear, without a shield, and they weren't even saying anything back? Do you think they didn't spit on them? Make fun of them? And laugh at them? Can you imagine how they must have felt? Yeah, I didn't know we were going to be in this kind of an army. Can you imagine they come in every night and they sit in their tent and even their wives are going, I'm not really sure that Joshua's got it all together. I mean... We're supposed to be fighting. We're not breaching gates. We're not building ladders. We're not building catapults. We're not doing anything as far as an army. Nobody's out here training. He's just got us marching. You say, why? Because sometimes you need that time making those bricks and learning some things about character that there's times I have to do things I don't understand because it's right to do them. But they ain't always fun. Joshua, yes, sir. It is the seventh day. Yes. New orders. About time, sir. No offense. What would the order of the day be? Instead of doing what you've been doing once a day, I want you to do it seven times today. Yes, sir, Lord. Oh, wait, I got one more thing. Shout and look out. <laughs> well, sir, shout and look out. Yes, sir, why is that? He goes, well, make sure that on that last pass you don't walk too close to the wall. Because when you shout on that seventh time, those walls are going to fall out. And you better look out. And when you go in there, don't touch their thing, that's all mine. And Joshua did what he was told today, told to do. Twenty years in Egypt. Forty years walking in stinking circles because of the disobedience, the murmuring and griping of other people when him and Caleb were ready to go in by themselves and take over the land God promised them. And forty years, that same monotony every day. Nothing new, nothing exciting, no Shekinah glory, no mountain on fire, no law being given, no thousands of people, just every day people died and griped. And then one day the Lord said, okay, they all dead now, let's go. Joshua was like, man, I've been waiting for this day. And the Jordan splits and across he goes and the Lord said, now you're going to do some more walking. Man, Lord, I mean, I thought we were... No, just going to walk. I'll get to Gideon in a minute. Do you think about Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbeer? Come here. Yes, sir. Tell the king ain't going to ring no more. You say, oh, I could do that. Maybe the fact that God hadn't called you is because He knows something about you that me and you don't know. Take Elijah for granted. Oh, well, he wound up depressed under a juniper tree. He did a lot more than wind up depressed under a juniper yes, tree. Yep. He had a little bobble along the way. You don't kick him off the team because he fumbled it once. You know why? Because sometimes a fumble makes you more careful next time you're carrying the ball. Elijah went on for years even after he failed. You say, why? Because the hardest thing in the world is to get up after you messed up. There's a gravity that just sucks you to the ground and it's like, I can't get up. I'm trying to get up and people won't let me get up and they won't forget I got up. And the Lord's hands down there like it is with Peter and said, come on boy, I'll help you. But you got to be willing to reach up and grab that hand. Amen. You know that nail scarred hand. Yes. Well, Gideon 
becomes a great warrior. The Lord finds him. You know what he's doing? What he's supposed to do? He's threshing wheat. And the Lord walks up to him and says, Thy mighty man of valor. And Gideon's like, He's hiding behind where they thresh the wheat because the enemy is right out there and he's threshing the wheat, but he ain't throwing it too high because he doesn't really want them to know where he is. And the Lord shows up at an unbelievably inopportune time, out of nowhere. No, not looking for it, not expecting it, not waiting for it to happen. I'm happy threshing wheat. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. Never any, no mention at all of him desiring to be a warrior, wanting to be a Joshua. None of that. Nothing about him wanting to be a judge. Nothing. What am I? Happy doing what I'm doing. The Lord said, Thy mighty man of valor. And he said, uh, Okay, Lord, I guess you see something in me I don't see. But before he becomes a judge, and the Lord uses him to bring a great victory to the nation of Israel and destroys all those people, let's look for just a moment or two and see if maybe there wasn't something preparatory along the way. Several years ago at Waterloo, as a matter of fact, there was a dictator, his name was Napoleon. And I know some of you read and you're familiar with that, but he's there and he gets defeated very badly and he's actually getting out of there. He's leaving. He's trying to escape. And he had a bunch of old guys. They were actually called the old guard. And they were guys that were in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. And they had been whittled down to about 40. The illustration is, is about 40 people. And when the enemy had had them completely encompassed about, they were completely overwhelmed. There was no question there were several thousand people that had surrounded these 40 guys. The old guys. Just old guys. And the English said, hey, surrender, you can take your horses and your sidearms, but there's no more need for more bloodshed. Waterloo was a horrible battle. And you can go back to your homes in peace. And they waited until evening time and made the same offer. And those 40 men made a circle with their backs inward and facing outward. And they refused. And they said, Viva la France. And let the emperor live forever. And with that, the English cut loose on them and destroyed them and slaughtered them and left no man standing. But boy, what a way to go. You see, that's foolish. That's how most people are with their Christian life. I'm not willing to die for a principle. It's all about self-preservation. When the Russians were coming in toward the end of World War II, I'm coming to Gideon in a second, they were overrunning all of the... Hitler's armies were stretched out from here to there and they were down to the youth peat, the, 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 the young kids that were out there fighting and all. And a 19-year-old, his name won't come to my name, it starts with an S. I can see it. It's written in German, but it's S-E-R something there, V, I can't remember it. But anyway, I can see the name right there. But the story is told to him that he had gotten there and the guns he had were out of ammunition, his sidearms out of ammunition. One of his hands was cut off and in a sling and the other hand was bandaged up. He'd been shot up pretty bad his whole group that he was around was there and the Russians moved in on him and he didn't even have anything so he's standing there with a with a bayonet that's there and he's holding it in his hand barely able to stand. And the Russians came and leveled their muzzles on him and told him to surrender. Some of you will get this and some won't. He spit in their face and they cut him down. But boy what a way to go. If I have to live and be under the rule of the Russians, <laughs> knew he was going to die. But see, that takes a real man. 
That takes a man that's sold out to a cause greater than himself. Gideon wasn't Gideon until after Gideon went through some things. Can I show you a couple of things? Maybe it'll help you. I hope that it will. And Judges chapter number 6, look at where he began. Look in verse 25. And it came to pass the same night, the Lord said unto him, this is after he said, Thy mighty amount of valor. Verse number 25, the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullet and the second bullock of seven years old and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath and cut down the grove that is by it and build an altar unto the Lord thy God on the top of this rock in an ordered place and take the second bullet and offer that blood sacri burnt sacrifice to the wood of the grove which thou hast cut down. I'd like to say, number one, he was willing to follow orders. But what he was asked to do was a difficult thing. He's fixing to go against Baal's altars. And his father wasn't doing right. So he had to be willing to do right even though his family wasn't for it. You think it's easy to tear down an altar that an animal is sacrificed on, but try tearing down somebody's altar of their own doing, their own making, their own self-made ideas, their own thoughts of what's going to happen to you as kids as you begin to grow up and, oh, you're going to go to college and this is what you're going to do and this is where you're going to go and this is who you're going to marry and this is how it's going to be because it's all about them and their reputation. And when you kick that altar, oh, man, it's, it ain't an easy thing. You know, one of the first steps that I know or recognize is that the Lord test him whether or not he was willing to go against what his father wanted and to what his the Holy Spirit wanted what God wanted. There had to be a choice made. Over there in the New Testament, in Luke chapter number 9, when he says to the individual, would you follow me? He said, let me go first bury my father. And you say, why? Because that family tie can sometimes keep you from doing what God wants you to do. It takes a man to say, I, I don't care what mama and daddy said when it comes to the Lord or mama and daddy or the Lord and my wife and the Lord and my husband, the Lord and my family. I know I'm in the South. That's a tough thing. But see, we all want to be the Gideon that has the faith to break the pitcher and blow the horn and see the Midianites destroyed, but very few people want to go through the preparation process. <coughs> See, Gideon would have never had the opportunity to take that group of individuals and see a great victory if he didn't pass this test. You know, and the Lord said to him, He said, first of all, I want you to tear down, let's use it this way. The reason we're going against Daddy because Daddy's wrong. Daddy is worshiping Baal. Does that make it more clear for you? Because some of you are like, yeah, I'm going to rebel against my dad. And he might just smack the tar out of you too in the name of Jesus. But if dad's worshiping Baal, would you be willing to step out? I know a young man that God had called him, dealt with him as a young man about being called to preach. And he went and he told his parents and said, Hey, I've been called to preach. I'm going to Bible school. And they said, Hey, preaching is something somebody does when they can't do anything else. You need a career. And it takes a man to say, Well, I'm going to do what God says. Whoo! That's tough when... People well-meaning think they can plan your life. But daddy's worshiping Baal. And he said, the first step's going to be, you're going to have to know that the way daddy's going ain't the right way, and you're going to have to make a public statement. Number one, he says, tear it down. Number two, he says, build it up. Sure. So when we take out the wrong things, you've got to put in the right things. Are you staying with me? You can't just tear down the other altar. You've got to put the right altar in its place and you have to put the right sacrifice on there. Here's the misunderstanding is, is it's just the Baal worshippers asking for sacrifice. Oh, no, 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 no. The Christian life is always going to be asking you for a sacrifice. That's the beginning of your worship of the Lord. This is what happens with Abel. I mean, excuse me, with Gideon that happened with Abel. You might recognize or understand that your worship, your beginning walk with the Lord begins for you putting on the altar whatever it is that God wants you to put on the altar. Amen. Your pride, your reputation, your own will, your own way. you got to remember Joshua had been under Pharaoh and no control of himself until God set him free. Amen. Joshua probably could have survived in the wilderness. He did for 40 years, but he chose to stay there and suffer. 
with the people there in Egypt until God saw fit to bring Moses. And 60 years later, finally elevates him to the position of general. After 60 years, I'd like to say, number one, you've got to build down, a build up. I mean, tear down. Number two, you've got to build it back up. But here's the thing I'd like for you to see. Look in verse number 27. The word then. Gideon took two men of his servants and did. As the Lord had said unto him, so it was. And so he feared his father's house, hold, and the men of the city. First obstacle. I tore it down. Daddy's going to be mad. <laughs> I tore it down. Daddy's going to be upset. You know who else is going to be upset? The men of the city. The people that live in the town. You know what he said? He said, listen, it says then he went and did. He didn't hesitate. I believe 1% hesitation is 100% rebellion. The Bible using Gideon as an example said, hey, God told me I'm going to do it. I'll worry about the repercussions later. He didn't sit down and figure and think, now when dad comes against me, when the men of the city come against me, he said, God told me. So guess what he had to do? He had to walk by faith. Because if you're going to learn anything about God, you must recognize you've got to do what he says, whether you understand it or see it or not. Amen. Am I going to do what God says? Well, I know, but I got special circumstances. A special dispensation is committed unto me. Where's your faith, Gideon? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Lord, I'm going to do what you told me to do. What's going to be the repercussions? You've got no idea. But the Bible said he's still human. You know what it said? He's afraid of his daddy. <laughs> He was afraid of the men of the city. Wouldn't you be? He just literally, he like went down to the big Catholic church downtown and burned it to the ground. It would be similar. So do you think he might be concerned about some repercussions? I think maybe so. And the Lord said, hey, while you're up there, go ahead and make an altar and put the right bullock on that altar and make a sacrifice while you're there. And let them see that you've changed from who they worship to who you worship. But I'm going to submit to you, Gideon's worship was known the second that he stepped out and did what God told him to do. Amen. I guess I could put you on the spot here and say, would you do what God wanted you to do? But God's not going to ask you to tear down Baal's altar if you don't obey Him in the minorest, the smallest of things. You can't be trusted with authority because you refuse to submit to it. It would be great if we could get individuals that are more willing to serve at nighttime in the basement than in the bay window. Where everybody can see, remember it was done at night time, what did he do? He pulled it down, verses 25 and 27. He did it. It was false, it was deceptive, but it was God's will. He built the right altar. I had a bunch of notes on the altar here, but we don't have time. But let me show you the response of what happened when he did it. Verse 30. The men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son, that he might die. Now, Joash... You understand? That's Gideon's daddy. And he's saying, your boy came against you, so now it's your job to kill him. You bring him out, we're going to kill him. Bring out thy son that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove. That was, I mean, he must have had a giant weed eater. He went to town overnight, man. I mean, he, made, he took those beautiful groves and cut them down overnight. Kind of had a bunch of chainsaws, probably had the Evans family coming down. Instead of singing, they're firing up the chainsaws. And when they wake up the next morning, man, that place is rubble. I mean, it is nothing. It has been literally trashed. And they know right off the bat who did it. They don't have any question about it at all. And then notice what his dad names him. Therefore on the day he called him, his daddy changed his name, Jerubbabel, saying, let Baal plead against him because he hath thrown down his altar. 
death in one form or another is the world's penalty for you doing what God tells you to do. He was opposed to the men of the city for the right reasons. The first faithfulness, sign of faithfulness, is when you draw opposition from the ungodly. Amen. I did what was right. Okay? Why do we have the same friends? Why no opposition from the world? If I'm doing what is right, why is it that nobody's giving me any heartburn over doing things that I know are wrong? We sure want the kids to know that. But I can't really cut them business deals off because, you know, I mean, that's different. I know where to handle it. Baal's altar is still around. And as long as Baal's altar is there, you can't have your altar. I'm reminded of a man by the name of Enoch. The Bible doesn't say whether or not he had a family, but if he did, it doesn't even say that his family went with him. It just said Enoch walked with God and he was not. I don't know that he had him. I know he was a preacher, but I know this. In the days of Enoch, there wasn't anybody else that was preaching. The Bible said Enoch walked with God and he was not. There was one guy that made a difference. Boy, if we could find one guy. Oh, I can make a difference. I got a new way to work out. I got a new way to kick a ball. I got a new way to throw a ball. I got a new way to invent something for the computer. I got a new way to do business. I got a new way to make money. I got a new way to get into Bitcoin and make thousands and thousands of dollars. I got a new way to have financial success. I got a new way to cook. I got a new oven to make. I got a way to make financial, but God help us. If somebody said, I ain't got a new way for nothing, I'm just going to stand for Jesus. And all of a sudden, that one man is like, oh, 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 yeah, that's for them old people like preacher. One man can make a difference. You say, where would you get something like that? Uh, One man died on a cross, stupid. One man made a difference in my life. Don't tell me one man can't make a difference. It is a Bible precedent, a Bible doctrine. It is a Bible truth. One man can make a difference. Oh, for that one man. It can stand up and do what's right in spite of the difficulty, in spite of the trouble, in spite of the problem, in spite of how hard it is for that one. And just says, hey, I'm going to do what God says to do if it hair lips the cotton picking devil. Amen. Everybody in the church and the rest of the world, I don't care. I'm going to do what God Amen. says to do. Amen. I watched yesterday. He got the late Friday night, flew in and and you got there early yesterday for a couple hours of the visitation. And I watched his people. Bobby, Bobby was, he tried to preach. He just really wasn't a great preacher. And, and, and he went to school, but something was always kind of getting in the way. You'd be surprised what it was getting in the way. It wasn't the world and all its charms. He was always so busy just helping other people. Just doing stuff. For other people. Preacher, what do you need? Preacher, what do you need? Preacher, what do you need? Redoing stuff. He'd do anything. I mean, he'd pick up a mop. He'd pick up a broom. When I would see him, I would see him running around in that golf cart like an idiot. Running around in a golf cart like he had no sense at all the way he would drive that thing on two wheels. And jump out of that thing. He was an EMT for seven of those 11 years he was saved. And he would jump around and he would help all kind of people do different things. And after everybody went to bed, he'd be in there cleaning up. And I watched yesterday as several hundred people came in to pay their respects to a no-name individual. You can't find this sermon on YouTube. You can't find a placard with his name on it. But everybody that was there, the test, if they'd have opened it up for testimonies, I would have been late for church. Everybody there said, man, Bobby did this for me, and Bobby did this for me, and Bobby 
did this for me and Bobby helped me with this. And Bobby, it wasn't just paying respects to a dead man. It was sincere. It was real. I told my wife, I said, I'm going to go to Bobby's funeral. She said, I'm going. She said, he helped me. I went up there one year at camp, blew the whole bottom of my shoe out for whatever reason I don't know. Bobby said, preacher, if you'll give me that shoe, I'll fix it for you. He said, ain't no preacher should have to preach barefooted. I came in the next morning and there's my shoe. The whole bottom had been put back on it and it wasn't just fixed, it was polished. He said, I need to have the other one so I can make it match. Amen. Took a rag and some shoe polish. He handed them things to me. I'm sitting down. He said, to them that preach the gospel. He said, maybe this will be a little improvement. And you said, what well, was it? One man. One man. There was not a person there that had anything ill to say against him. Not a person there. Never caused the trouble. Never caused any difficulties. Never had any problems or nothing like that. Just always there to help out. One man can make a difference, but very few men want to pay the price. We have a lot of individuals that are around the ring ropes. I was at a wrestling match one day. We call it wrestling down south. And we used to have to work them. Me and Monroe, we would work them. And yes, it's true. Monroe one time did crawl up into the ring and grab the bad guy and haul him out of the ring. That is a true story. I watched. I was like, yeah, go get him. When you get him down here, I'll come help you. They thought it was a sideshow. Uh-uh, no. He crawled up under that rope. He said, y'all hold on just a minute here. He grabbed that guy like that. and He walked out there and he slung him under the rail like that. I, I got him! You know, he <laughs> walked out. But we used to have to watch the, work those wrestling matches. And there was this guy down there in the ring and he is just fit to be tied. And they can take it a little. You know, they're getting ridiculed. They're getting laughed. Oh, this is fake. That's fake blood. Oh, this is this and this is that. And I don't know if it was the Zip and the Zam and the Rathmataz or the Purple Haze or the Andre the Giant. I don't remember who was there. Ric Flair, crazy foul mouth. I, I don't know who was in there, but it was them guys. And they were really good athletes. And he just kept on. And he just kept on. And he just kept on. And finally that guy said, you want to come on in here? And he's like, yeah! And I thought, this is not going to end well. I thought at first it must be part of the show. And the next thing I know, he's got that guy up like this and he's fixing to, and somebody hollers, don't do that! And so he lays him down on the floor and then he runs up and pulls one of them, you know, and that guy... You know when you get the wind knocked out of you and it's out of your diaphragm? I mean, he looks like a fish that's been pulled out of the water and he's trying to say something. He's like, oh. Oh. Somebody said to him, have you had enough? Oh. And somebody reached in and pulled him out of the ring. And when he caught his breath, here's what he said. I was close enough to hear him. He goes, they're not faking. <laughs> Which reminds me to say this, we have a lot of Christians that are outside the ring. They can't take the ridicule. They can't take the hardness. They can't take what it Boot camp prepared them for when push comes to shove, shove, all they can do is mock people that are trying. Amen. And make fun of people that are making an effort. Yeah. Not winning every bout, but at least making an effort. Well, let's hurry through the story. His name gets changed for the right reasons. He has the right kind of enemies. Now Gideon comes to a point in his life where the Lord has now recognized 
He's not just one of those fair weather kind of individuals. God sees something in him and yet tests him anyway as if he does not know what the outcome is going to be. I've seen many a Christian who God's dealt with. And then you know what happens, right? When they have the chance to break through that and miss the three things I'm going to give you, which is the meat of the sermon and we're going to go home. You know what they do? They pull out. Like I told you the other night, the five kings rise up and say, yeah, but. What about my comfort? What about my convenience? And what about what I want? And what about me? And it becomes the meistic, meism that winds up controlling. But let me show you what Gideon got and I'll close. Look in verse number 34. You say, what happened? He became Baal's antagonist quite becoming, in God's eyes, of a man that's named that way. Elijah was known for rebuking Baal. Paul was known for rebuking the Pharisees. Who are you known for rebuking? Well, verse number 34. What's Gideon get out of all this? The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet. And the visor was gathered after him. And I say first number one, after he was obedient, he got an anointing of the Spirit of God. Amen. Brother Larry, I've heard preachers ask me many times, they say they want to preach like Brother Lentz. I said, you ain't got the grit. What do you mean? I said, I mean you ain't got the grit. So you have no idea when you see Brother Lentz preaching the price that was paid for years and what had to be overcome in order for the anointing of the Spirit to be upon him. You're like Simon over there with Peter. You're trying to buy the Holy Spirit. Paul learned that lesson when he said, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. You know what he said though? Fellowship of his suffering. Paul understood that. I like to preach like James Aloysius Lentz. You ain't got the grit. Right when you have a chance to have God's power put on you, trouble comes your way and you go back. You come down to the water and you've got a few thousand still remaining, about 12, and you're down there, about 10,000 down there. And the Lord said, anybody that sticks their head in the water, dump them. Gideon says, that don't leave me with but 300. He says, yeah, but their God is their belly. And when they see the water and hole, all they're interested in is preserving themselves. He said, you want somebody that's always on the lookout. Yes. Yes. Let's do that. That's somebody I can use. Lord, there ain't many of them. Yeah, I know. I've seen them come right to the very thing they prayed for. Yeah. And God just waiting to dump it on them. They bury their face in the pool and suck up all that water and look like a puppy and puppy chow. And walk off. Oh, it's too hot for me. I ain't, I ain't going to war today. I'm too full. And they miss the anointing of the Spirit of God that they've been praying for God to bring them. Number two, it's in the passage. Look what he gets after he's obedient. Did you get that? He didn't give him the spirit to be obedient. It wasn't, Lord, make me willing to be willing. It was a test of his will. Will you do what I want you to do, whether I enable you or not? As much as I can in my own strength. Hey. Hey. Number two, we're almost done. He gets assistance or the enabling. Look, if you will, in verse 35. And he sent messages throughout Manasseh and also was gathered after him. And he sent messages to Asher and Zebulun and Nephtali. And they came up to meet him. He didn't get a help until after he got the anointing. 
the assistance didn't come in the beginning. He had to just take them, people that were around him. Ten of them. Just ten guys at night time. How come they didn't come after the other ten? They're nameless. You know who they came? The ringleader. They came after Gideon. Gideon's getting hammered. Nobody's stepping up. But boy, he got a feeling of the Spirit. His eyes were opened and he received the assistance he needed. Look in verses 36 to 40. He finally gets some answers. Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I'll put a fleece of the wool on the floor. And if dew be on the fleece only, and let it be dry upon the earth beside, then shall I know thou wilt save Israel by my hand. You know what happens in verse 38 and then verse 39. He does the same thing, but can I say this to you? Look in verse 40, and Gideon did so, and God did so that night. For it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew upon the ground. Can I say this? He finally got an answer to his prayer. Can I pick on you? We usually reverse the process. We want the answers. We want the assistance. We want to be enabled by the anointing. God said, no, obedience, anointing, assistance. Now I'm going to give you some answers. Which indicates to me, I can't handle the answers without the anointing. Don't get spooked out. I'm not charismatic. He's talking about the anointing. I'm not going to blow on you. My breath would knock you down. Feels like the bottom of an ashtray right now. Llama breath. God says, you're a mighty man of valor. But he would have rescinded that if Gideon had not been willing to do what God told him to do without any special answers, without any special vision. It's the same thing that happened with Noah. Build an ark. Do you realize how stupid that sounded? I mean, we don't really play it up as much as it ought to be played up. Build an ark? For what? We don't have rivers crashing through this place and places to go and the size of the boat you're talking about. <laughs> You'd have to have an ocean to float that. Lord said, I'll provide the ocean, but you've got to provide the ark. Amen. Man. He doesn't get the answer from God until he starts building the boat God told him to build. Sometimes we want the answer because we'd rather walk by sight than we would by faith. Amen. And then, you know what? He showed us what He's going to do. It scares the pee willy out of us. Right? That's just a country. Just as a, it scares us to death. Right? And then we're like, okay, Lord, who's going to help me? And the Lord's like, well, I, I, I'm going to be here. Amen. Oh, Lord, anoint me from heaven above. No, the Lord never told Gideon and he was going to get assistance. He just said, I'll anoint you. You might go by yourself. David comes back to Ziklag. You remember that story? You boys ought to read them war stories. They're good stories. David comes back from Ziklag. They're going to stone him, Right? You know what David says? He talks to the Lord. He said, Lord, shall I go? He said, yep. He said, by myself? He said, yep. But I'll be with you. And David said, I'm going. And then the other guy said, well, okay, I guess we'll go too. We usually want to fix it. Lord, who are you going to send to help me? Isaiah stands up. In Isaiah chapter number 6, after seeing all of those things in the nation he's living with, in Isaiah 5, he comes to Isaiah 6 and there's the Lord you know what the Lord says? I'm looking for a man. Amen. A man. Not just any old man. A man 
To do what? Be part of a hedgerow? Just stand in a hole? Just fill a gap? Just be a rock? Just be nondescript? Just not stand? Just you be part of a hedge? I'm looking for a man to make up a hedge. You know what he says? Send me. Hey, I didn't tell you I'm going to have anybody with you. I don't care, Lord. If I get to do that for you, send me. Here I am. Send me. You ever read the book of Isaiah? That's in the beginning six chapters. Isaiah, 66 chapters. He stinking gets hammered. I mean, hammered. One of the greatest preachers in the Old Testament. Lord, here I am. Send me. Hey, could I ask you something, Gideon? Could he call you off the bench? If not, what would be your excuse? You got too much water in your belly? You got your face buried in the world and all its successes and all of those things you've missed out on in life? Because you were born in the United States. All the entitlements, all the uh, recognition, all the appreciation. You wouldn't want to serve Jesus. Where's the paycheck in that? Amen. I'm looking for a man to make up the hedge. I'm looking for a man that's not ashamed to go, yeah, I fought for the Lord with a pitcher, a little candlelight, and a stinking trumpet. Really? Who'd you kill? Nobody. Made a bunch of racket. He killed them all. I wanted so bad to use the message at youth camp. See if I could fish the pond for a man. Because I feel sorry for women today. Because there ain't many men around for you to latch hold to. That have enough backbone to do something for God Almighty. They're sold out to everything else and they're learning it from their day. No burning desire to serve God or to be a preacher. Preachers have become so effeminate and so worldly and so unlike God that guys are like, I don't want to do that. I'll do anything. Oh, I can be a great athlete <coughs> for a while. I'll accomplish great things for a while. Say, so what are you doing? David had a very small group, but they were called mighty men. Benaiah. I'm bored. It's snowing and cold, and there's a lion down in the bottom of that pit that needs killing. And I'm going to go kill him. Dodo who says, you ain't taking my pea patch. Amen. And the sword becomes part of his hand because he never stops swinging. Amen. Amen. Looking for a man. There were days where men aspired. And wanted to be preachers. Yes. And wanted to serve God. Amen. And nowadays, I don't know where the snips came in, but they've been gelded and all of a sudden there's no spiritual fortitude at all. They can whip your hiney in a boxing ring or in athletics, but they got the stinking spiritual nature of a net. Yes. Amen. Amen. Sons growing up with no backbone, no character. No desire for God. It has to have been passed down. Yes, 
I'm looking for a man. You say, why? The Bible tells us if I do what God tells me to do, He'll anoint me when I need to be anointed. It ain't all the time. But it's enough of the time to know He's real. If you'll give me your attention for just a moment longer, as go the men in a country, so goes a nation. And men, this ain't for women. You know what the women will do? They'll be the first one down here. Their little hearts are tender like a hummingbird's wing. And they'll be down here, Oh God, help, oh God, oh God. I mean, they'll weep, they'll cry. They'll be more worried about their kids than you are. It's men now that aren't being men. Play the man. Sometimes you got to act it when you don't feel like acting it. Suck it up. Well, it's tough. It's hard. It's rough. Yes! Because it's valuable. Thank you, brother. Amen. 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 Looking for a man. Make up a hedge. Because one man can make a difference. Oh, I'm not deluded to not think that some of you are here this morning going, my God, I ain't coming back for that. I can already see some of you women reaching over there and grabbing your husband by the knee. Baby, don't be thinking about God. Be thinking about me. You're scared to death that you're going to get dethroned by God. Amen. Come on. This nation needs to be awakened, but it ain't the women and it ain't the kids. It is the men. It is our responsibility. It falls upon us and we need to stand up and stop being a bunch of feminized men. And I don't mean queer. Amen. 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 I just don't, I don't know. Well, how do you feel? I don't know. Well, how do you feel? Well, I just don't really know. We're going to fight. Who's going to be first through the door? I don't know. What do they have armed over there? Get out of the stinking way. Well, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd rather go home than to be carried. Not me. Like to go honorably. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes. I'll be jumped if I was willing to lay down my physical life for what I used to do. If I do any less than that for what I do now, then I should be taken out now. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. But there's that sort of Sunday night. Oh, preacher. Wednesday night. Oh, preacher. Fasting, Lord God, preacher. I just, I just can't. Your belly's too full. Amen. Baby, we ain't going back there tonight. Him putting all that pressure on them kids. Hey, you liver-lillied, yellow-bellied sap sucker! Don't you try to convince her or your kids, I'm after them. You the one under conviction. And boy, did you used to like it. But now you're sitting there like a stinking little... Well, I reckon got him, got him running. Want to give him espresso this morning? Couldn't be an anointing. Couldn't be a call to battle. I'd sometimes rather have a dog next to me in a foxhole than some of the people I'm supposed to be standing with. At least I know the dog won't run. That's good. Gotta go. See you Sunday night. See you Wednesday night. Here's part of the message I didn't go to and I'm done. I was going to tie it in with Thomas. I think the only reason Gideon had ten 
was because it was Sunday night. And he couldn't find anybody that wanted to get up out of their bed not to tear down an altar of Baal and to go to work on the midnight shift when nobody else wants to work when all the ghoulie monsters are playing. I think he could only find ten because it was a night. I'd like to, preacher, but I just can't right now. I'm sleeping. I've got something else to do, somewhere else to be, somewhere else to go. I'm looking for a man. That's what he's looking for. Gideon. He's a mighty man of valor. How did he start, preacher? Doing what he's supposed to do. And the Lord put him to the test. Hey, Gideon. That bother you, that altar of Baal over there? Matter of fact, it does, Lord. You know that's your daddy's, don't you? You going to live your spiritual life off your daddy the rest of your life? And die and go to hell, boy? No, sir, I'd rather have you go tear it down. And by the way, take the most valuable of them bullocks, that one that's seven years old. You might miss that in the past if you're not paying attention. Yes. It wasn't just any bullock. It's that one been pinned up for a special sacrifice. He literally just took the most valuable thing that was going to be given to Baal and he said, I'll take that. And Gideon said, man, that's daddy's prize goat, man. He said, get him. He said, I believe I will. He took him out there and he tore that altar down and laid that old bullock up there and slaughtered him and then tore the altar down. And the Lord said, now build me another one. Must have been tough with 10. Been easier with 20. Amen. God's army is always a minority. Amen. Amen. Some of you used to tear the roof off when I'd preach a little hard. Yeah. You've gotten sophisticated now. You're not ready for battle anymore. It's been quiet too long. you got it all figured out now. I listen to the old preacher preach a lot. I, I like to listen to him. I think he's a real good uh, role model. I'm listening to him preach one time. He's preaching to about 600 kids. You know what he said? At the opening part of the message, you know what he said? He said, two-thirds of you ain't going to amount to nothing. What a way to warm a crowd. He said, you know why? And I thought, he's fixing to tell them. When he asked that, that's rhetorical. It's kind of like, well, if you don't, I'm going to tell you. You know what he said? He said, because two-thirds of you are here for the barley loaves and the fishes. And then he got in that kind of a growl in his early days. And he said, and when the barley loaves and the fishes run out, you run away. He said, if you want to listen... I can help the third of you that might want to do something. But he said, the fact is, statistically, you'll go from this youth camp to being an adult and you won't do nothing now and you won't do nothing then. You'll be a burr under some preacher's saddle because you don't want to do nothing. And then he preached a message. I'm thinking, give the invitation. You say, why? For me, this is just me. This is how I would think. You're telling me I ain't going to make it? You're telling me I don't want to do something? Oh. Reverse psychology? Uh, uh, mm -mm. Mm -mm. I'm going to show you, old man. I would have gone, Ah! I'd have been a big man. I'd have been Peter. Lord, don't all others. I at least like that Peter thought he wouldn't. Not anymore. Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll serve you in an advisory capacity. You come let me know if you, if you need something. Are we doing okay on time? That's the introduction. <coughs> Maybe the introduction's enough. God hasn't quit calling men. Amen. But you got to be willing to be obedient before you expect the anointing.
before you expect the assistance and before you can expect an answer. Why would the Lord give you an answer when you won't even be obedient? God, tell me what's going to happen. I ain't doing it. Lord, show me what the next... I ain't doing it. Why don't you do what I told you to do? Make bricks? Yes. How long? I ain't telling you. Long as I say. Making bricks 20 years. What's that for? The Lord said, oh, you've got no idea what that's for. I'm going to give an invitation. Before you come, I want you to think. If the Lord were to allow you the final thing that Gideon got, which was the delivery of a nation, and if you want that to be the epitaph on your tombstone, If God were to say to you right now, let's start by doing what I tell you to do, just tear down the altars of Baal. Take down the altars of the world. Take down what you're sacrificing to. Oh, let me just touch it for a second. You say, what is that? You will give your time. You will give your talent. You will give your calendar to everything in the world, but if God were to step in today and say, Hey! I need you! Let's see, Lord, I could... Uh, when did you... When were you need me? Now! Oh, no, 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 no. I, uh, uh, I, see, I got all these plans next week. You need to take a week off and go to youth camp. Nah, you know, you need to be there every night. You need to listen. To, no, I, I, I listen to him on YouTube. I'm, I'm good, Lord. So. Okay. See ya. You will sacrifice and work overtime for an extra dollar. And God just asks you for some extra time in the morning to read your Bible and, oh, Way too much. Let me give you an illustration. I'm going to close. And it's their fault. But part of this message is there. I had a couple, I'm not going to tell you who, had an opportunity to move from where they were, where God was feeding them in a church. They had an opportunity to move not that far away, but they'd have to travel a couple hours to make services. Very lucrative. Well, kind of deep into six figures. Looks like match made in heaven. Insurance. All the details covered. Right, left. You know what they said together collectively? I think it'll work good. We should go. But let's ask him. And they prayed. And a preacher got the text and said, We ain't leaving from where God put us just in order to be a little bit more comfortable. You say, what is that? That's a man. You hear me, son? That's a man. That's a man with a backbone like a soul. So here's the invitation. God, not me. He's still looking for men. He may not call you to preach. He may not call you to be a missionary. But He might. But He sure as I'm standing in this pulpit based on what this book says, He has sure called you to be the man that God would have you to be. Whether you're married or a daddy or not, He would call you to be a man. And where does it start? It's interesting. Look at the passage it started at an altar. You say, why? Because sometimes at the altar you've got to tear some things down before you're ready to build some things back up. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.